Jerusalem, he was, Jesus was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met with ten lepers, who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourself to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. Everybody say, praising God with a loud voice. How do you praise God? With a loud voice. Hallelujah. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. You see, in the days of Jesus, Samaritans were looked at as foreigners and people that not as good as the Jews. You know, the Jews, they, they, they actually had the view that the whole world is actually less than them because they were the chosen people. And the Samaritan was still less than them because they were mixed breed of, of, uh, of locos and, and, and different race and so forth. And, and so... So, so here, this Samaritan came and thanked the Lord. And Jesus answered, were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Heavenly Father, I pray this morning as we spend some short time together that every single word that proceeded of this mouth of clay be words from heaven. I yield myself to you. I pray that you'll block every word of man, word of flesh, to come out of this mouth for the next few minutes. As I yield to you, I pray that every single individual in this room will leave this place refilled, recharged, renewed in our mind, and we can walk in greater newness of life. In Jesus' name, and everybody says, amen. amen. Now, you're all very familiar with this story about the ten lepers who had been healed by Jesus, and nine of them, for some reason, didn't come back to give thanks to Jesus. And when this leper came back, and he was a Samaritan, he came back to thank Jesus, as we read just now, that Jesus gave him something that he didn't ask for. Jesus gave him something that he didn't ask for. Do you realize that, oh, what did Jesus give him? Jesus gave him sozo. Okay, so the word made you well is in the Greek word sozo. And for some of you who've been Christian for a long time, you know what sozo means. Sozo means a whole life. Sozo means a complete blessing of God. And sozo means that you are blessed in every area of your life. Some of you say, well, I've been a Christian for a long time. I don't seem to have any sozo. Listen to this. You know your God is such a good God. He loves you so much. And he would answer all your prayer, whether you believe it or not, whether you've experienced it or not, is true. That he will answer all your prayers. But you know that when you are becoming thankful, not taking things for granted, especially before God, you thank him and you be grateful to him and you give him all the thanksgiving and praise that is due unto him. He will begin to give you something more than you could ever ask or think of. A lot of us ask for things and when we get it, that will be the end of it. We like... We, we go in a merry way, that, which is fine too. You're not going to get punished. You're not, you know, God is not going to be mad at you. But you know, when you come back to him with thanksgiving, having a grateful heart, not a heart that is full of the attitude of entitlement. You know, we're living in a generation and a time that every, almost in a, or a lot of individuals in the society feel like they're entitled to something. They've been told that they're entitled to something. And so for them, gratefulness is really not in their vocabulary or in their lifestyle. Consequently, they would still live, they would live, they have been provided for and so forth. But how many of you know that if you want God to do something more than you could ever ask or think of, which is what he promised in the Bible? Yes? 
You know, some of us just sitting there and go, oh, I thank the Lord that he provided me for everything that I need. But you know, if that's where you want to stop, that's fine. But it is his will and his purpose to provide you more than what you asked for, more than what you expected. And you say, I'm not getting that. Well, look up, it's coming. It's coming. Some of you, I don't know. It's true. It's coming. And for this ten, le- for this ten, ten lepers that got healed, nine of them got what they needed. One of them got more than what he needed. So if you want to be a candidate to get more than what you needed, you need to have a grateful life. You need to have a life that is full of thanksgiving. You know, in the Word of God, it's littered with all the instructions, all examples of people being grateful unto God. And when they're being grateful unto God, they see great things. And this example here, Jesus is showing all of us is that when you come back and be grateful for all that you have. So many of us have many things already, but we haven't really paused and give thanks. You know why? Because our eyes is on something else. We're just trying to press for other things, and we don't know how to stop and be thankful for the environment that God had put us in, the things that he had blessed us with, the provision, the health, you know, everything that is around us. We haven't stopped to give him thanks because we are so busy in looking towards something else. Other Christians, on the other hand, they are not looking for something else for more, but they are absolutely anxious. They are anxious about problems they have. They are anxious about their children. They are anxious about whatever, their job, their, their, their promotion, or their money, or their, their children, or all kinds of stuff, you know, sickness and disease. They're anxious about it because they're so anxious they don't even appreciate what has been done to them thus far they can't see it they worry sick they're thinking about it all the time they're thinking about oh how am I going to do this how am I going to solve this problem and they're stressed silly because of all the anxiety but I want you to turn with me to Philippians and you know the scriptures very well chapter 4 verse 6 the Bible says do not Be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplications, let your requests be made known unto God. Did I read it right? What did I miss? Do you know a lot of our supplication is missing with thanksgiving? This is an instruction here from Paul that says, listen, you want your prayer to work? Have you mixed your prayer with thanksgiving? The last time when you come before the Lord and requesting God to to deal with the situation at your workplace, to ask God to take care of your finances, to take care of the issues that you're contending with, did you remember that in your supplication and prayer, which you must do because the Bible had instructed us to do, in that supplication, did you mix that with thanksgiving? Here Paul the Apostle is saying, do you know, when you come to God and not be anxious, then you are able to easily give your supplication or mix your supplication and prayer with thanksgiving. But if you are very anxious, you are thinking about your problems all the time, you are getting worried about what you you need to do or what other people need to do or what, what the uncertainty is, you probably will have a hard time remembering the thanksgiving. I remember when I was a child, uh, I wanted to go to a very prestigious school. You know, and uh, it was, anyway, so uh, I, and, and I was told that I, I was too stupid to go to that school. And in fact, the people in my church that, that you know, my parents' church, they actually mocked me. They, they called me zeros. So mean, eh? I didn't blame them because I wasn't paying attention to anything, you know. I was always rebellious, you know. I always break things in the church. I always steal money in the church, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I deserve that, I guess. You know, my sisters, you know, they all get A's. When I get A's, heaven rejoices. (laughs) So anyways, I wanted to go to this prestigious school. And I realized that I didn't have the marks for it. And so I came to the Lord and prayed. And my mom would tell you every day, 
at five, six o'clock, I'll go to a prayer room. You know, we live in the parsonage, and so, you know, she could hear in the prayer room. So I would pray unto the Lord. I would cry out to God. And, but I was told that in order for you to have a proper prayer, you need to mix it with thanksgiving and praise. And I always get frustrated with that because I say, I really need to get to my agenda. I haven't got time to thanksgiving. Like, I really, really need to. So I did thanksgiving and praise out of obligation, you say. Because they say that's what you need to do. And therefore, I, I just did it out of obligation. But while I'm giving thanks and praise, I was thinking about the possibility of people's prophecy over my life being fulfilled. Prophecy of, of, of failures. Prophecy of, of, of uh, not able to make it. I, I was concerned, you know. And, and uh, in his grace, God knew I was prideful too because, you know, I wasn't humble or whatever. I want people to know that I'm not stupid. I need to prove something. But God is so good in his grace. He still, he still loved me. You see, sometimes when you have a wrong motivation to pray, you know, God still answers because he loves you. Now, there are times that, you know, uh, if you're doing it because you want to indulge in lust, James says, you know, uh, some of you are praying and you can't just receive anything because you pray amiss. You pray that you will indulge in your lust. And, and you know, Keith Green used to say, you know, you pray for blessings, but God says, I can't just feed your flesh. That's something I can't do to feed your flesh. But anyways, I was praying to the Lord, God, I, I really need you to help me. And I would be praying in the Spirit, speaking in tongues, you know. And, and there are two things I was anxious about. One is to get into a good school. Another one is not to get left behind. See, around the 70s, there's a lot of talk about Jesus was coming back imminently. And, and so, you know, there's this, this movie called uh, a Thief in the Night. Some of you remember that, some of you older one, you know, Risen Thunder, you know, and, and all those, uh, uh, the Year of the Beast, you know. I watched that. Actually, I get my daughter to watch it. She got scared herself, you know. It's like, oh, you know, I don't get left behind. <laughs> so I always worry. So I come before the Lord and say, oh, God, there are only two things I need from you. Number one is I want you to remember me when you come back. I don't want to get left behind. I had dreams about me getting left behind. You know, many dreams, not just one, many dreams. Some of them's like, I'll be floating up, you know, I was making it, boom, I dropped back down. You know, it's like, what just happened? You know, you see, wrong teaching, right? Wrong believing, therefore making a really messy dreams, you know. But I uh, didn't, didn't know grace back then, you know. Didn't understand how, God, how much God loves me, you know. And, you know, people talk about, you know, just, just one tiny little sin, you know, and boom, you're going to be left behind. That's a huge conversation about that. But anyways, it's not for today. You want to talk about that? We'll talk about it later. But so I just, Lord, I just didn't want to get left behind. So I have two quick questions. So in my prayer, I spent about 80% of the time being anxious about these two issues every day. Now, in His grace... I didn't get left behind, glory to Jesus. <laughs> he hasn't come back yet, that's why. And, uh, but even if he does, I, I, I won't be get left behind, hallelujah. And number two is that I did go to that nice prestigious school and got, you know, got good marks for it and, and praised the Lord and God answered my prayer. But I would have spared myself a few white hair. You know, I have a lot of white hair at a young age, you know. If I could understand not to be anxious. And instead, I should occupy my anxiety with thanksgiving. You and I need to occupy our anxiety with thanksgiving. Because if you don't have thanksgiving, anxiety will come and invade your space. So for that 80% of the time, I could have just worshipped the Lord and just blessed Him. Now, later on in my life, I realized how powerful thanksgiving, praise, and worship is. So I spend most of my time now just thanking the Lord. I hardly ask Him for anything. In fact, I can't remember the last time I asked Him for something. 
I have come to the place where, Lord, I just trust you. You reign. You're in charge. I'm not worried about anything anymore because I know you're a good God. You've got the best plan for me and that you've got the best solutions for my life. I don't even have to worry about it. And there may be problems that are coming that I'm not even aware of and you already got them fixed. Thank you, Jesus. I want to trust you and thank you. So I'm filling my time with thanksgiving. Guess what happened? Go to the next verse. And the peace of God. Man, so many people are struggling for peace. Struggling. Struggling for peace. Struggling to have a settled heart. Do you know whatever that caused you to be unsettled? Maybe it's a fault of somebody. Maybe somebody did you wrong. Your heart is not settled. Maybe something is going on in your, in your situation at home or in your finances or at your workplace. Maybe it's not a fault of your own, but you're full of anxiousness and you're so full of anxiety. You need substance to help you. You need things to substitute just to, just to get your mind off. And at times you'll find yourself frowning in the mirror naturally. The Bible says, if you want the peace of God, you need to replace your anxiety with thanksgiving. Bring your supplication to God. Bring your needs to God. Somebody was saying, you know, maybe I don't need to pray. Well, you know, the Bible says we ought to pray. Pray without ceasing, in fact, the Bible says. But bring that supplication to God. And your prayer should not be full of begging. Most people, prayer is full of begging. God, I need this, I need this, I need this. In fact, when they don't have any needs, they actually stop praying altogether. But let your prayer be filled with thanksgiving. I thank you. Some of you probably sitting there and say, I got nothing to thank for. Oh, you'd be surprised. You look around. You look around. You have a lot to be thankful for. You know, I was driving the other day down on the street in the neighborhood. All the trees turned yellow. And I look up to the sky, it's blue. It was so picturesque, so beautiful. In the old days, I, as a kid, I would go, oh, nice. But you know, I pause. I say, God, this is so beautiful. I thank you for letting me live in this country, so beautiful, f- breathing fresh air, cool air. Look at this scenery in front of me. It's so pretty. It's so, I thank you, Lord. I thank you for all this good thing. You know, if I don't fill my days and my mind with thankfulness, anxiety is going to come anxiousness is going to come and, and all those disturbance is going to come and guess what? You're actually opening up yourself to all kinds of attacks that you didn't ask for. In this season of Thanksgiving, you know, we talk about Thanksgiving, right? I do not, I encourage you not to only be thankful during Thanksgiving, but that your lifestyle is full of Thanksgiving. And when your lifestyle is full of Thanksgiving, you'll be full of peace. And check this out, right? And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. In other words, peace that doesn't make sense. Have you ever had peace that doesn't make sense? It's like there will be war. I think I heard a testimony about an, a Christian pastor, or he is just a semi-pastor. He's not a full pastor. A Christian pastor in Aleppo. How many of you know the place called Aleppo? You heard, heard that? So I'm, I kind of, I'm, I kind of, we kind of connected to a Baptist church in Aleppo through another brother. And um, he, uh, he's actually a missionary, and we, in fact, we used to work together um, uh, when we first started this church uh, many, many, many years ago, about 20 years ago when we first, no, not 20 years ago. My marriage is 20 years. I always get confused between my marriage and the church. You know, it's like, the so church is about, well, how many years? Some years ago. And so when we first started this church, and I think it's like 14 years ago or something, when we first started this church, you know, uh, this brother, he was very helpful. He is actually a Syrian Christian believer himself, and, and he had been so helpful in bringing people to our church. And I remember one time, you know, I've been praying to the Lord, you know, God, we started this church for a year already, and nobody came. I'm totally digressing now, right? I'm going to remember to come back here about the Aleppo Christian. So, you know, I, nobody came, and, and uh, 
and uh, I was so frustrated. And one day I had lunch with this brother, and, and he said, you know, I'm going to bring people to your church. So I was, we were worshiping, you know, Pastor Yang was leading worship. I didn't want to look back because it usually becomes very discouraging, you know. When you first started a church, you look back, it's all empty, and you're like, oh, I just don't want to do this again, right? Every Monday, just want to quit, right? But, um, you know, so, so I didn't want to look back, and, and so I was worshiping the Lord, you know, just be anxious for nothing, just thanking Jesus. And, and this brother Joseph, he was amazing. So I turned around that day. It was packed. I was like, what happened? <laughs> a revival. But anyway, so, so through him, I began to know about some of the plights of many of the Christians in Aleppo. And Aleppo, as you know, has been war-torn, completely destroyed, and so forth. But the believers there have testimonies about the joy and the peace of God. I have pictures sent to me from the Christians in Aleppo. Man, they are, they are smiling. They, they don't have a, a lot now because the church is all, all just bombed down, and it was just, and, and you could see Christians sitting on the plastic chairs. They're full of joy full of joy. I was thinking to myself, wow, that's the promise of God, that He'll give you joy in a place when joy is not making any sense. He'll give you peace when you're in a place where peace is not supposed to be there, which means He gives you peace that is beyond your understanding, beyond logics. It's like, you're not supposed to be peaceful, man. You're supposed to be all anxious and crying and begging the world to help you. But instead, these believers, they, they, they gather together. And you know, I had another picture they sent to me, is that they were packing bags, little bags, to give out to other people. They themselves are in the middle of a war. And they are thinking about blessing other people. That's the peace that is surpassing all understanding. And so, when you begin to live a life without any anxiety, and you fill your life with thanksgiving, you will see the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. And this peace is not only for you to feel good. This peace, watch this, is to guide you. This peace, if you know and experience this peace, you will know that is an amazing guide. You know, as a pastor, as a Christian, I, have con I constantly have to make decisions about people and church and me, myself, whatever. And when I was young, I would ask advice from people, ask advice from older pastors. And, you know, bless their heart, they try their best to give you the best advice they know. But, you know, they're not in your shoes, they're not in your circumstance. And besides that, God has a unique plan for each and every one of us. We do need advice because the Bible says that it is with many counsels that we are protected. We do, we need to humble ourselves. But sometimes there are things that people can tell you and say to you that they can only say so much and they can only help you so much because you are in a very unique situation and position. All of us are. And that at the time when you need guidance and that people can't help you, what do you do? You second guess yourself? No, oh, you need the Holy Spirit to guide you. And how does he do that? Well, he says, if you are not anxious and you give thanks and your life full of thanksgiving, he will have this peace that will just show you where to go. Let me give you an example. If you were to have to have two girls, you have to decide which girl to pick to marry. I know all you men have the problem, you know. <laughs> or you have two men to choose which one to marry. You know, you can never tell. Even if you've been dating for a couple of years, you can't tell. I'm telling you, you can't tell. You can, just sometimes, sometimes they hide things. They're so good at it. They just hide things. How do you know? How are you going to know? After you get married, it's like, 
you know, a lot of people, you know, they think after they get married, it's, it's, they done, it's done deal so they can just let the guard go and just let the guard down and just... So how do, you, how do you determine? It's that peace. So you know, you one day you go out dating with this guy and the Holy Spirit just go inside you. But you thought, oh man, but he's so handsome, he's so rich. Right? But the Holy Spirit go And then you go out dating with another guy and you just feel such a peace. And your heart going, but he's so poor. <laughs> he's overweight. What's going on, Lord Jesus? Now he's guiding you. You see, he knows the future. You don't. See, this, this, this cool dude could actually have an affair in the future. You never know. He's so cool. It might ruin your life. You know, I actually know of a story. It's a true story. I, you know, another person in this place know about that story too. Do you know, this, this, young, this young woman, she was a young woman, you know, she met this handsome young man. You know, she was a doctor herself in her own country. She was a medical practitioner. And then she met this wonderful man that, you know, just, she, he swept her off her feet, you know, because he was so handsome and, and he was so successful in his business. So, and then, then she followed him to Canada, you know, they're supposed to have such a wonderful life. Life, and they started a business. They became very successful, you know. And so the, 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 the husband said, you know, you don't need to practice medicine. Don't need to pursue your medical career. Just stay home and take care of the kids, you know. Everything seems to be so beautiful and so wonderful. And one day she found out that he'd been cheating on her. See, handsome and beautiful now doesn't guarantee anything. God knows your future. I say, God knows your future. And so, no, so this guy could be like, you know, chubby and, and ugly, you know. But you know, you marry him, if it's the Lord's will, of course. You know, you don't pick chubby and ugly. But if you, you just, you just, that's not your guy. Your guy is your peace. You understand that? So you pick, you pick the right guy. You pick the guy that may, may look like it's, it just doesn't make sense. And maybe your parents wouldn't approve of him, you know. But you marry him because there's a peace of God in your heart. You say, you know, Father, I just, and you tell your parents, you know, I just got the peace of God and go, oh, blah, blah, and people persecute you, and you go ahead. And then who knows? After you get married, he got a big break, and you know, he become very successful. And then sometimes something just happened to him. Maybe the Holy Spirit just inspired him. And he's, you know, I mean, it's never too late. By the time you get to 40, he start working out like Pastor Paul, you know, just... <laughs> And then, you know, and then, and then now he's handsome, he's buff, and he's successful. How would you know? You never know because you can't see the future. Come on. Now, how are you going to let yourself be guided by the Holy Spirit? Number one, don't be anxious. Number two, giving thanks and having a thankful lifestyle. Then his peace will come upon you and that peace will begin your guide and that guide will lead you to the purpose, the perfect plan of God. Amen. Hallelujah. That's the plan of God that God has for us. If there's anything that you can remember today, Remember this, thanksgiving is a gateway to greater. Does it make sense? Yes. Thanksgiving is your gateway to greater. Cynicism and feeling of entitlement is a, it's a sure way to shut down opportunities in your life. But when you're grateful, when you have thanksgiving, you begin to see doors start to open up. You know, I love my kids. I'm going to close with this. I love my kids. And um, they both, I will buy things for them without them even asking, you know. And uh, I will, you know, when they want something, you know, I, I really want to get it for them. And, and uh, although sometimes if they're trying to take advantage of it, I, you know, like I, I'm strong too, glory to Jesus. So, but I, but you know, if they become very grateful every time I buy something for them, you know, like if I want to buy something for them, right? And they and I surprise them, they go, Wow, Dad, thank you so much. Oh, I love you so much. I give a hug, kiss, kiss, 
then I'll feel really good. Then I'll be looking for opportunity to bless them more. But if I buy something, I want to surprise them, you know, like for example, I buy them a computer. That's going to happen. It's not going to happen. But I buy them a computer, you know, and uh, they're here, so that's why I have to set expectation, you know. I buy them a computer, you know, and then, and then they walk into the room and brand new laptop. Hey, Krishna, wow, $1,000 laptop. And then she go, uh, whatever. Well, you know what? That would be the end of it. <laughs> Do you understand? What's this? What do you mean? Oh, whatever. But then if they go, oh, I can't believe it. Oh, that I'm so thankful. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. <laughs> that will motivate me to do more. It's the same as Jesus. You know, Jesus blessed the 10 lepers with the healing. But one came back and Jesus said, Great, I'm going to give you much more than you asked for. Souls of a whole life. More than just healing. But everything is whole before you. Everything is whole in your life. That's the plan that God has for us. But it starts with us with a thankful heart. Being thankful and have a thanksgiving prayer all the time. And mix our prayer and supplication always with gratefulness and Thanksgiving. Tebby, can you come? Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. So this weekend, we're celebrating, celebrating Thanksgiving in Canada, you know, and uh, we're going downstairs and have some food together. Or, uh, you know, and some of you will also have family turkeys. But remember, This season, pray to the Lord and commit to Him and to yourself for your own sake. Father, that I will become a grateful person to you, to my parents, to my children, to my bosses, to my friends, colleagues. I will be known as a thankful and grateful person not a grouchy, cynical, complaining person. I'm always looking for opportunity to be grateful. Always looking for opportunity to give thanks. Even when I do come with real needs, need of healing. Some of you are contending with healing. It's a life and death situation. Healing for yourself, healing for your children. You're contending for that. May I encourage you this morning that let your prayer and supplication be mixed with thanksgiving. Your prayer will go a whole lot further before the Lord. And not only in prayer time, but having a lifestyle of being grateful. Reject anxiety. Reject anxiousness. Reject all those worries that you would come across. Occupy your mind Occupy your heart, occupy your mouth, your lips, your voice with gratefulness, with thankfulness. And when people talk about you, may they say, so and so, I don't know about him, something about him that is always grateful. He's always so positive. He's always so encouraging. He knows how to give thanks. So give thanks, will you? First to your God, then to your surrounding, to the people around you. Let us be a grateful group of people. I can hear in my spirit some say, Pastor, you don't know the mess I'm in. I got nothing to thank God for. I've been going through hell. How could I give thanks to the Lord? Do you realize that your God, your God is a good God. He is, he was not responsible for all, whatever decision that other people had made that had brought you to where you are. He's not responsible for your sickness and disease. The Bible says every good gift come from God. Not every gift, every good gift, only good gift comes from God. The rest, you can go figure it out. Is not from God. And so He wants to bless you. He wants to bless you. And no matter what, how the devil had, had tormented you and 
savagely wounded you in your life. He's here this morning to want to heal you, to want to restore you, to want to give you back more than what had been stolen from you, to want to restore you back more than what had been taken away from you. Things that have been ripped out of your life, God is going to restore them to you in Jesus' name. But you know, you know where it starts? It starts with you. Father, I thank you. I don't understand what's going on, but I thank you that I'm still alive. I'm still breathing. I thank you that I can still sitting here this morning. It's not by accident that I'm sitting here this morning hearing this message about thanks, thankfulness and being grateful. I thank you, Lord. I will, I will start by giving you thanks. I will mix my supplication and my want, my desire with thanksgiving. As you do that, friends, I'm very confident that you will see things turn around very quickly for you. He will open the way for you. He will use His peace to begin to guide you in every step of your way. Sometimes He will guide you to places making decisions that makes zero sense, that surpass your understanding. But it's okay. Go with the peace of God. Don't go with logics. Don't go with reasoning. Don't go with what other people may, may or may not say. Your final conclusion must come from the peace of God. In Jesus' name. And that starts with you being grateful, being thankful. Father, we thank you so much. We give you praise this morning. We thank you for all that you provided for us. We thank you for everything that is good in our life. In Jesus' name. We also thank you for the food that you provided for us and the friendship and fellowship that we have in the, in, in the kingdom of God, in the family of God. And I pray that this friendship would be strengthened in this time of fellowship together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.